And Chelsea Manning leaked uh, all that material. Um, that was the first time I heard about Lady Gaga. I didn't, I, I don't keep up with popular culture, so apparently she'd been very famous for a long time already, but, but I found out about Lady Gaga because uh, Chelsea uh, put her, all, that, all that data on a Lady Gaga CD. And, um, and then uh, the helicopter massacre got seen by people all over the world, and one of those people who saw it was a guy named Graham Dunstan in Queensland, Australia, and, um, and uh, he had the thought that a lot of other people have had, which is something along the lines of, if, you know, 10 million people with sledgehammers could really just solve all the world's problems. <laughs> Watched it on the TV. Machine guns fired towards the ground. I watched the people run. Helicopter gunship strafing the street. I watched them lining up the bodies in the Baghdad heat. They say these leaks had consequences. I must agree When I saw them fire on the children It affected me I thought what if I were wearing The other shoe And if I had a hammer What would I do? I am just a person Like anyone just another mother's son. I have no special powers. I cannot fly. Not like that helicopter gunship up in the sky. Sending all those bullets all around to the journalists and children on the ground I am just one man that's very true but if I had a hammer what would I do Sometimes I try to wonder Why should I care? But then the answer seems so obvious There are people down there And right here in Queensland There's an army base and There's a helicopter gunship Just sitting in place There's a time for watching there's a time to act. It's just gonna kill more children if it remains intact. I am just one person, but you are too. And if you had a hammer, what would you do? If you had a hammer, what would you do? in New Zealand now, but I'm not. I'm stuck at Narita instead. I should be singing into me the smoking kiwi pot and chilling with the kiwi reds. But when I showed up at the airport to board my flight, I was handed somebody's cell phone. Suddenly the future didn't look so bright and I entered the twilight zone. The woman on the line said, hello, I'm from immigration. 
You may have a ticket, but you can't go to our great island nation. I felt like I'd been hit in the face with a big old kiwi log. And then I felt the Stasi's cold embrace when she said, I've been reading your blog. The spies are reading my blog, the introduction and the prologue. And if that's so, it just might be true that they're watching this video too. Well, I know don't get many views, a few hundred friends and kooks. So it comes as surprising news that some of them are Kiwi spooks. I try to get my missives out and cause some small commotion. Someone's listening now, there's no doubt, across the South Pacific Ocean. The spies are reading my blog, the introduction and the prologue. And if that's so, it just might be true that they're watching this video too. Were you strip searching in Trondheim, she asked. What kind of things do you smoke? Have you ever been charged with a crime? Are you rich or are you broke? Have you ever been turned away from any borders you tried to cross? What kind of venues did you plan to play? Do you use dental floss? I said it seems a bit unusual for you to do things quite this way. I asked her, is this normal? But she wouldn't say, she'd just repeat her message. At Narita, you shall remain. I've read your blog, each vile passage, and you may not board that plane. The spies are reading my blog, the introduction and the prologue. And if that's so, it just might be true that they're watching this video too. They're watching this video too. Yeah. In Australia, um, I had, had the great pleasure of hanging out with uh, a bunch of Sea Shepherd people. <laughs> and that is one dedicated, hard working bunch of uh, folks from all over the world. Wonderful little community. Time to leave now from Hobart to Antarctica. So close, but so far from Australia. Watchful eyes are always peeled, cause you never know there's a growler below. Watchful eyes peeled for predators and prey, where all you can do is whatever you can to keep the hunt at bay. The time is coming, and it's coming soon. Giving. The sea floor is a grave for those capsized before us fell beneath the waves. Perhaps we'll join them by accident or not, a gale or a storm or a well-named shot. We'll steer around the ice and right into their sights. Everyone must pick their battles. This is our fight. So here beneath the Southern Cross and the Crescent Moon, we'll stand between you and that harpoon. Just a little space, and that's where we could see your face. Look into your eyes and hear you sing. You come to realize you have to do something. Sometimes all you can do is do your best and hope that someone else will do the rest. So once again, we'll spend this afternoon standing between.
between you and that harpoon. Between bad and worse, worse kept winning. And um, in Australia, in Australia, the more progressive of the two criminal organizations were um, were basically advocating for putting the immigrants, or the, the, basically putting the refugees trying to escape the wars in Sri Lanka, Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere, who are the main people trying to get to Australia, who they call, uh, you know, what do they call them? Uh, you know, victims of human trafficking is what, is what, is what they like to call them. Um, in actuality, they're, they're refugees escaping war and persecution from war zones. and. Um, and then, and then, uh, so the the more the more progressive of the two uh, groups wants to put them on in, in concentration camps, in islands, but that are not even in Australia. Like apparently, Australia isn't big enough to hold the, these people, you know. So they have to put them somewhere else. And um, and then and then you got uh, the liberals who are the conservatives, um, who who are the you know, because everywhere outside of the U.S., liberal means neoliberal, and uh, and so the, the liberals uh, they they want their campaign is to stop the boats. So that's which is significant because they don't advocate putting the people in concentration camps. They advocate turning the boats around, and which is an interesting concept because these boats are barely seaworthy in the first place. So the idea of taking one of these boats from Sri Lanka and turning it around and sending it back to Sri Lanka is Oh, it's mass murder is what it is, and it's also completely illegal for you know all these countries that are signatories to these you know, UN you know. But then you got the Murdoch press that's you know right there with both of them you know. And then it's just an especially weird thing because you're in Australia, which is like you know 99.8 percent of the population got there on a boat. <laughs> Fathers, mothers, parents came here on a boat. Came from a land of kings and queens, but on the wrong side of the moat. My fathers, fathers, parents came here on one, two. They didn't want to leave Austria, but it was the thing for Jews to do. I don't know your story. But I bet it's more or less the same What kind of war famine was on When your family came before Their ship arrived Did your folks come here To discover and explore or were they refugees running from the war? Did they cross the freezing mountains to make it to the sea? All the while wishing that they never had to flee. Were they marched across the jungles with chains around their feet, nearly dying of exhaustion? In the desert heat Before Their ship Arrived Did they make a life here? Or were they kidnapped and detained? 
held for years in the limbo as their optimism waned. Were they turned down for asylum and told they shouldn't lie, then sent off to be tortured, sent back home to die? Did they get to move here, create their lives anew? Or were they held on Christmas Island Asking what on earth they could do before Their ship arrived Before their ship And, and then while the elections there were happening, and then you had, um, you know, back home and land of the even more free, um, <laughs> you have, uh, you know, John Kerry uh, getting on TV saying um, this speech, which was fantastic. It was a fantastic little specimen of, of speech craft because he started out saying, uh, he, started, he started out the speech saying, we, I'm not going to get in front of you and and lie to you like uh, like the, like the Bush administration did in 2003 about our reasons for going to war. And that was a lie. He started out lying. <laughs> the first thing he said was a lie, and then he proceeded to lie some more. It was fantastic. <laughs> He didn't even start with like a fact or something truthful, you know? He b began the speech with a lie and everything he said after that was a lie. It's perfect. There's an uncivil war in Syria, 100,000 dead, millions of refugees without a roof over their heads, proxy armies flowing into a country open wide. You got Al Qaeda in America fighting side by side. You got Saudi monarchs and French socialists on one team. You got Russia and Iran backing the regime. You got the Arab League having another meaningless debate, saying, let's just see what happens if we wait. But now the West says gloves are off, it's all become too real. Now Hollande and Obama are dictating the deal. Now red lines have been crossed, now it's time to act. Now it's time to have a few million tons of impact. Now it's time to do the thing the West does best. Time to step in the hornet's nest. We don't know who did it, but there's been a war crime. So we'll bomb an Arab country one more time. What we know is this, there was a chemical attack Kind of like the ones that happened in Iraq Like the white phosphorus we used on the people of Fallujah Or the chemicals we sold to Saddam for Halamja But this time it's a different story This poison gas in Ghouta, our allies would never do this Those foreign fighters in Al-Qaeda We don't know who did it, but there's been a war crime So we'll bomb an Arab country one more time We don't know who did it, but we know who is to blame. The Ba'athists are the party, Bashar Assad is the name. We don't know who did it, we can figure that out later. Meanwhile, we'll turn Damascus into a smart bomb crater. We'll fix them with cruise missiles like Baghdad and Mosul, where they now have peace, prosperity, and democratic rule. We don't know who did it, but there's been a war crime. So we'll bomb an Arab country one more time. We don't know who did it, but there's been a war crime, so we'll bomb an Arab country one more time. <laughs> Desert Fox. Desert Fox. <laughs> I got to do a song for the dog. <laughs> In Greece, um, the. Uh, you know, in Greece, they're 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 arresting uh, the leadership of Golden Dawn finally, and um, of course, it, and it, it has been from its inception a criminal organization. I mean, this is uh, one one point of uh, where where it's not difficult to agree with the uh, 
the Greek government, which is saying that it is a criminal organization because it's clearly a criminal organization. Of course, when the main thing that they did was beat up immigrants and kill them, that didn't seem to be a problem. <clears throat> but uh, once they killed a Greek person, then, uh, then that, that became a problem for the Greek government, evidently. And, um, and uh, you know, Greek, Greece is a, it's an interesting situation there because, uh, like, for one thing, um, I mean, of course, it's, an, it's a situation that's imposed from other outside of Greece, you know. But, um, but you know, the Dublin Treaty and, and, uh, and, and Angela Merkel and everything. But basically, also, um, one, of the, one of the things left over from the Greek uh, dictatorship from the years after the dictatorship was that uh, how public servants vote is public information. So it is actually a fact. Like when we say, you know, we, we on the left often like to say that cops are fascists because of the things they do and whatever, you know, it's just, just it's like rhetoric, you know, it may be true, it may not, you know, they're not all fascists actually. But, um, but you, what you can say without any exaggeration is that a full 50% of the Greek police are actual fascists. <laughs> because, you know, Golden Dawn got 7% in the last election of the overall vote, which is scary enough but they got 50% of the police vote. And um, so, so here's uh, a song for the, uh, the most militant left-wing canine in Greece. Um, who, you know, you may know that uh, it's not just the humans that are left-wing and militant in Greece, it's also the dogs. And you can see this, it's very, uh, it's very clear when you get there, you know, you see the, the, all these people hanging out in the parks all night, every night, you know, they're chatting, they're playing bazookis, they're drinking in moderation, and then they're occasionally going and burning down the financial district. <laughs> Fine combination of activities, you know? And uh, you only need to burn down the financial district like once every other month to give yourself something to talk about the rest of the time, you know? So it's like, they don't really need to go all out and burn it, you know? It takes a while to fix up all those buildings and, and you know... They, they, they never fix the buildings. I mean, they replace the glass, but those, those buildings are black with soot, you know, from all the, all the burning. But, um, but they replace the glass quickly and they have riot cops all over the place. The riot cops are guarding the parks and waiting for something to happen. And then, you know, basically the cops being cops, they'll provoke things, you know, so they'll, you know, basically, they're, I mean, they're fascists and they're young men and they're clearly jealous because like, you know, they're all these, these guys dressed in riot gear getting glared at by, you know, a, a, a basically by a whole lot of young people, 50% of whom are like attractive young Greek women who they probably would rather not be getting you know, glared at by, you know, the, in a different situation, you know, they, they, you know, they, it's probably not their optimal, you know, scenario for life, you know, to be standing there and glared at by all these nice young people who are, you know, <laughs> playing bazookis, and maybe if they even like Greek music, these cops, you know, I don't know. But they're standing there getting glared at, and so, you know, they'll just provoke a situation, they'll, they'll walk into the parks, hello, that's great, you gonna join me? So, they, they, the police wade into the co into the parks, and they and then so the people will back up, and the dogs will back up, and the and the dogs will start barking, and they'll, they'll hold their ground, and they'll act like they'll growl, and they'll act like dog, you know, guard dogs, and the police will advance, and the dogs will back up and uh, growl, and and um, and so then the police will start firing tear gas, and the dogs and the people will run to the other side of the tear gas cloud, and from that point the people will throw projectiles. And the dogs will bark, and uh, you know I, I have absolutely no doubt that the dogs would also be firing projectiles if they had opposable thumbs, but they have to just settle for barking. But there's one dog, Lukanikos, which means sausage, and he he just stands right in the middle of the tear gas cloud and barks, and he never runs. He never runs from the police, and so. You know, the, so he's become quite famous because, you know, the world's media comes to film the, the Greek riots and look at good shots of mean-looking riot cops with tear gas clouds around them. And then there's always this cute little orange dog that's, like, messing up the shot. And so, so then people wonder, like, why does Lukanikos never run from the police, you know? And so the most popular theory is that he's just too, too left-wing and too militant to just bear the thought from running. But then some Greek biologists have been putting out the theory that, you know, the hypothesis, I guess, you know, that 
that perhaps he is an example of a genetically superior dog that has evolved, a you know, adapted to his environment, and he has evolved an immunity to tear gas, you know, which which would be a very successful uh, adaptation for a Greek dog, you know, that would seriously help, uh, you know, propagate the gene pool if you didn't have to worry about the tear gas, you know, get on with business, and, you know, so. So who knows why uh, he's he never running for the police. But I, uh, you know, when I was there a couple of times and looking for Lukanikos and, and every time, but the thing is that um, I discovered when I got there how difficult this was going to be to find this dog because, because you know, there's thousands of left-wing militant dogs and, uh, <laughs> and they've, been, they've been forming a superior gene pool for quite some generations and so, they are almost all medium-sized orange and wearing red bandanas. <laughs> so, you know, trying to tell them apart, I mean, but what really impressed me was that although I didn't, you know, hadn't been around long enough to start differentiating the orange dogs from each other, um, you know, the Greeks clearly could tell the difference between them. And even, like, you didn't have to ask an anarchist, I mean, just anybody on the street, everybody knew Lukakos. Everybody. And, um, and so, you know, I would just be like walking around Athens and like every 50 meters or so there's like an orange red bandana wearing dog lying on the sidewalk. And I would ask some random Greek, like, is that Lukanikos? And they always knew who I'm asking about. And they always looked at him and said, no, that's not him. So I never got to meet him, but, but there's enough video footage that uh, I was able to write, uh, I think, a fairly convincing uh, song. Lots of folks are revolting. They've had enough of this shit. The rich are getting richer. They're saying that's it. But with Luke, it's different. That's clear as he emerges from the fog. Let's hear it for Luke Hanekos, the riot dog. It's a fight between people, but he is no pawn. He knows exactly which side he's on. In the machine of capital, he is no cog. Let's hear it for Lucanicos, the riot dog. When a smoke bomb comes towards him, he kicks it back at the fuzz. He acts a bit different than a normal dog does. He's got a fan page on Facebook, but he's got no time for a blog. Let's hear it for Lucanicos, the riot dog. Let's hear it for Lucanicos, the riot dog. Let's see, is it the... Seventh yeah. anniversary? Mm -hmm. of I remember just talking about that. Seven. And everywhere I go around the world, I meet um, people that knew Brad, Will, and he, he knew a lot of people. He traveled about as much as I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, and knew a lot of the same folks. And, uh... I, I met the, the last person that he had coffee with, uh, was a, a young woman in Japan. Well, I don't know how young she was. They always seem young in Japan, you know, <laughs> Japanese. But, but uh, yeah, Tokyo. And I was just hanging out with other friends of his uh, in Freiburg, Germany, who are working on a documentary about guerrilla gardening called The Strategy of Crooked Cucumbers. Because in, uh, this is weird uh, for North Americans, but in, in Europe, all the cucumbers are straight and wrapped in plastic by EU regulations. For some bizarre reason, you can't have a curved cucumber. It has to be straight. 
There's a lot of EU regulations that like that. They're even weird. He's okay. I don't want to Peter. I don't know what. Oh, he's yeah. He's gonna piss on. Why the dog likes the? Because I'll bet some other dog has done that before. I know. <laughs> Surrounded by police It was the one block in the city Where protest was allowed And they were there to keep the peace He said, hey, my name is Brad And I think we surely will Mess up these meetings These days will be remembered In the city on the hill I'd see you at the rallies Guitar on your knee the calm inside the storm From Prague to San Francisco Miami to D.C. You were everywhere With a smile on your face In the redwood forest Or the streets of Tuckin Square I'll go down to the water And with the morning dew I will watch the sunrise and I'll smoke this joint for you. I can see you on a bicycle, reclaiming the street, digging up the asphalt, build a bandit garden, and grow some food to eat. Got an email from Quito. He said, you've got to see this place. Everyone is rising up. Come and see the future of this lovely human race. I'll go down to the water, and with the morning dew, I will watch the sunrise, and I'll smoke this joint for you. in New York town Sitting on a rooftop Talking about relationships And how to live them down Heard you went down to Oaxaca To join the battle that was there I saw your picture in the paper With a bullet in your chest In your eyes a distant stare I'll go down to the water sunrise and I'll smoke this joint for you. I'll go down to the water and with the morning dew I will watch the sunrise and I'll smoke this joint for you. spent quite a lot of time traveling around South America and I get emails from them now and then talking about the reception to this particular song of mine that he would sing. Make friends. My name is John Riley. I'll have your ear only a while. I left my dear home in Ireland. It was death, starvation, or exile. When I got to America, it was my Enter the army and slog across Texas to join in the war against Mexico. And it was there in the pueblos and hillsides that I saw the mistake I had made. Part of a conquering army with the morals of a bayonet blade. And there amidst all these poor dying Catholics, screaming children, the burning stench of it all. Myself, two hundred Irishmen, decided to rise to the call. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. 
March beneath the green flag of St. Patrick, blazed Erin Dobra. Bright went the harp and the shamrock, and the earth had Padre Publica. Just fifty years after Wolf Tone, five thousand miles away, the Yanks called us a legion of strangers, and they can talk as they may, but from Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied, so we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We fought them in Matamoros, where their volunteers were raping the nuns. In Monterey and Cerro Gordo, we fought on as Ireland's sons. We were the red-headed fighters for freedom amidst these brown-skinned women and men. Side by side, we fought against tyranny, and I dare say we'd do it again. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We fought them in five major battles. Churubusco was the last. Overwhelmed by the cannons from Boston, we fell after each mortar blast. Most of us died on that hillside at the service of the Mexican state. So far from our occupied homeland, we were heroes and victims of fate. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied, so we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied, so we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. story of a hundred ships traversing the great big sea, moving the riches of the world in large ships owned by the captains of industry. They were heading to places like Amsterdam, London, and L.A., but they had to change their plans a bit when they were all the Somalia sailing the ocean blue. Here's to the pirates of Somalia. I'll raise the Jolly Roger to you. Hotted Heady is a town of fishermen living lives of hardship and toil. But today they had a really good catch two million barrels of oil. Doing what's just and fair Taxing the robber barons And taking their rightful share Here's to the pirates of Somalia Sailing the ocean blue Here's to the pirates of Somalia I'll raise a jolly roger to you 
that I could shake their hands and say, Good job, mate. I only wish that I could join them on the seas. Keep those tankers at bay. Tax the corporations and give the loot away. Here's to the pirates of Somalia sailing the ocean blue. isn't hard. The second step is everybody realizing they're like you. They're holding the same card. Step three is finding there's a tactic when everyone believes it could be true. That if all the people work collectively, there just might be something we can do and everything can change. So quick. will try hard to make sure it isn't so you don't have a problem and if you do it's not the same problem and if it is well there's just nowhere you can go but it's happened many times the history is rich though we easily forget how a meme can take hold and grab you how it can spread out like a net and everything can change so quick lost or we're dreaming or they'll make a dream for us they'll try to come up with a good story about why we belong at the back of the bus about why we belong in this position about how we don't know what we meant about how there most certainly isn't any such thing as the 99 percent but everything can change so quick Everything can change So quick And uh And there was uh <laughs> I mean, people were coming from everywhere, and um, and they were looking. You know, the German police were looking for weapons. You know, they were stopping cars on the highway. You know, they, suddenly there were borders. You know, the Schengen zone is only when there's no protests going on. But suddenly, when there's protests going on, there's borders. All of a sudden, they're, they're at the back. You know, they're back at the borders, and they're looking for anybody. You know, searching all these buses and stuff. You know. If you're driving around in a new rental car like I usually am, you just breeze right through. But if, if you're in like some kind of punk rock looking school bus, then, you know, of course, <laughs> then they're, they're looking in there and, um, and they're looking for weapons and they weren't finding the weapons, you know. And then, and then you get there to Rostock and like, so the police started this confrontation, which of course it was not surprising. And, um, and then, you know, suddenly you realize like, Gosh, they've been looking for weapons, but this whole city is made of weapons. You know, it's cobblestones. These cobblestones are loose. You know, you just, <laughs> like, you know, you just saw this crowd of like thousands of people all get the same idea at the same time. They just, you know, look down and like, oh, cobblestones. This whole city is full of cobblestones. And, you know, they could have had the thing in some other, like, more modern German city, like, you know, like Freiburg or somewhere like where they don't have so many cobblestones, but Rostock was part of East Germany and it was like more 
like older, you know, kind of, you know, not as fixed up and everything. And so it, it was it's made completely up out of cobblestones. So they were just smashing the cobblestones and throwing them at the police, and then the police were running away. It was really quite something. And, um, you know, the police don't have guns there, so they, you know, they actually, they just, they don't just start firing, they run away, you know, if they're getting hurt and stuff. It was really, it's quite something. And, uh, and I was, uh, so I, and then it was like, you know, at protests in the U.S., I've, I'm convinced that the FBI has infiltrated the sound companies, you know, because it's basically like, either you're playing through a shit sound system, or a, or a decent sound system with a sound person who's completely incompetent, and just can't find the volume switch, you know, or you have a good sound system, and there's a helicopter 50 meters above your head, <laughs> ruining everything, you know, it's like those are your two options, basically. But it's, it, this, in Rostock, uh, you know, I guess the intelligence services hadn't figured out the, the, you know, that they could ruin everything with helicopters because they didn't have helicopters directly over us. And we had this amazing sound system. And, uh, you know, unlike protests in the U.S. where they think that music should be relegated to the beginning and end and it, otherwise you should just have boring speakers for four hours, you know, it, the, the protest... Yeah. It, in Germany, they had they had this German hip hop act play for a half hour. They had one woman from Italy and one woman from Brazil each speak for five minutes or less or something, you know. And then they had me for a half hour for twenty thousand people. And I ended with this song. And uh, and then within five minutes, there were police cars on fire. And I was thinking, I was a little worried, you know, I was thinking, I really hope they have good free speech laws in this country, you know, I wasn't sure, but... <laughs> Rodney Coronado was arrested for a speech that he gave one evening by the San Diego beach. He stated his opinions, they sounded just like mine, now they want to put him behind bars till 2029. Prosecutors said the problem was the speech had showed intent. I couldn't figure out exactly what that meant. You can't describe an action, say you thought that it was spell. So what'll happen when we sing this? Who the heck can tell? But we don't like the condo and we're gonna burn it down. Corporate terrorists drive them out of town. We'll bring a lot of gasoline, pour it on the floor, light a match, say a prayer, and run right out the door. Burn it down. Crazy. 
And it's all becoming clear when they're gunning down our comrades and it seems the end is near as they're loading up the launchers for the tear gas grenades we can take off our bandanas and kiss behind the barricades when it's madness all around and you can see this at a glance we will sing and we will cry we will laugh and we will dance as they shout their marching orders beneath the helicopter blades we shall seize the moment for a kiss behind the barricades they will try to break our spirit and at times they may succeed but our love for the world is stronger than their greed when the building is surrounded and hope begins to fade in my final hour a kiss behind the barricades as the movement grows there will be hills and bends but at the center of the struggle are your lovers and your friends and the more we hold each other up the less we can be swayed here's to love and solidarity and a kiss behind the barricade.